thank you, Dyslexia International, for inviting me. I do hope you haven't mistaken me for my more famous brother, the famous fish chef, Rick Stein. I'm not him, but I am his older brother, and you will see there's a connection later that's enshrined in my title, full title of which is Wobbles, Warbles, and Fish, the Brain Basis of Reading Disorders or Dyslexia. Now, you may think that sounds mad, but I hope during the course of this lecture, I will uh, be able to explain to you why that makes sense. What I'm going to do is begin by recapitulating some of the, what you've been hearing already uh, this morning about the brain systems involved in reading. I'm then going to talk about the dis differences that are found in dyslexia, again, some of which you've heard already. I'm going to dwell briefly on controversies because I'm on a, one side of a controversial view about how the brain causes reading difficulties, which is not shared by everybody in this audience, I'm afraid. But I am in t I'm going to try and convince you all, even those who start out by not believing in the Magnus Solar theory of dyslexia. And it leads, this Magnus Solar theory leads to ways in which we can help people relatively simply. So first of all, what I want to do, if I can make this work, no, that's, that's the first problem with technology. It doesn't necessarily work. There we are. What I show you here is a rotating brain which um, shows you the areas in red which are involved in the visual aspects of reading. This is what's called an orthographic task, where the person has to say whether the word is a a uh, true spelling of a word or a misspelling of the word. So it's an orthographic task. And um, what you see is a bit unlike some of the images you've seen earlier, is the whole brain is involved. And there's not much greater in, in, uh, involvement of the left hemisphere compared with the right. And I'm going to try and explain that. So what I need to do is to explain to you that um, Reading, and again, you've been hearing some of this already, reading is basically done by two separate pathways. The top pathway in that, um, uh, in this diagram is, this is not ideal, anyway. The top uh, pathway in this diagram is the phonological uh, method of reading that you've heard about. That is to say where you have to, you have visually to analyze, identify, and sequence letters, and then translate them into the sounds they stand for. And that leads you to the melding the, uh, the sounds to get at the word dog. But if you are a practice reader, you use the lexical route or the di direct visual analysis route, which enables you to see the whole word dog and go directly to its meaning. So straight from vision to semantics. But what I want to emphasize at this point is that Everything inside that red line is dependent on visual processing. So contrary to what you heard this morning, not, I'm not actually in contradiction of it, but the fact of the matter is two thirds of the processes of reading de depends upon your visual system. That's not to say that phonological analysis is not important, and I'm the first to admit that the majority of dyslexics, not all, have phonological problems. But I'm going to concentrate on the visual problems just to be different. Uh, but first I want to remind you that the uh, reading network is complicated. If we start at the, uh, this is the back of the brain, this is the front of the brain. If we start at the visual cortex, this is where visual information comes in. There are two routes. There's a ventral route and a dorsal route out of the visual cortex. And that leads to this agglomeration of areas, which are called the supramarginal and, uh, and um, uh, angular gyrus, which is where vision is put together with hearing to, uh, and also the semantic saw probably is. And then the information goes forwards to the speech area if you're actually speaking the word. Now, what you can see is there are two broad areas, one of which is, broadly speaking, visual, the other of which is broadly auditory or phonological. And that both those areas have to be used for reading. Now, this is the, uh, the um, fMRI study that 
we, you heard about this morning, uh, Frank told us about, but I want, you to, uh, I want you to see that actually there's a parallel. These are actually areas that are less activated in dyslexics, these are adult dyslexics, than there are, uh, that are activated in good readers. And what you see is there's less activation of this whole axis of visual analysis, and actually there's an area down here that involves the cerebellum, which I'll come back to, and this is an axis involving auditory phonological. So nobody's denying that phonology is important. I want to emphasize that um, vision is also important. You've seen this before, and you see the same motif. Namely, there is, uh, there is a, um, uh, areas which have these uh, ectopias, which is, uh, uh, are growths of nerve cells um, where they shouldn't be in these little blebs here called ectopias. And you've seen that these are congregated, particularly in the left hemisphere, and uh, particularly in the areas that I've just talked about, the visual and auditory areas. Uh, this is a concatenation of a number of fMRI studies um, uh, put together by uh, Professor Pugh in Haskins Laboratory in America, which shows areas that have been shown to be less active in dyslexics than controls, or differently active. And you'll see there's the area that I've been talking about here, which is the supramarginal and uh, angular gyruses, areas 39 and 40 of the cortex, the left hemisphere. There's this one down here, which is actually temporo-occipital and is called the visual word form area, which you've also heard about. And there's this area here, which is the inferior frontal uh, cortex, which is more for speaking. So it's this area I want to concentrate on, but this is uh, equally important, as you'll see. And my starting point is studying children who complained that the letters and words wobbled when they tried to read. And this reminded me of patients I'd seen. I'm trained as a clinical neurologist. Patient I'd seen with cerebellar problems. Uh, Angela will be pleased to hear that. That's how I got into this subject, because many children were complaining of mild versions of the sort of symptoms with that people with severe cerebellar problems suffered from. So I thought they may have a cerebellar problem. I'd also studied a system called the visual magnocellular system. And I and my colleague, Mitch Glickstein, were the first people to show that the visual magnocellular system goes from the visual cortex to the cerebellum, as I'll show you now. Well, in a moment. Because this shows you um, two kinds of retinal ganglion cells. These are called magnocells, because they're large, these are called parvo cells because they're small. And the area of this cell from which it receives from uh, the receptors in the retina is something like 100 times the area of this cell. And so it's good at detecting blobs, um, and, uh, but there are less of them. Most of the retinal ganglion cells are parvo cells, and those are the small ones which are important for fine detail and color. But the large cells that I'm talking about are interesting are these 10% of large magnocellular neurons. And they're important for picking up changes in the visual environment, picking up motion or flicker. The differences are that the large cells can uh, respond best to this sort of blobby type of thing, whereas the small cells respond best to these finer gratings. Uh, and what's interesting is these two systems, I'm afraid now the brain's the other way around, this is the back and this is the front, so these two systems supply different kinds of processing. The parvo cells supply this so-called what stream that does go to the visual word form area and supplies information about the details of letters. So you identify letters and word forms with this pathway. However, more important, in my view, are the magnocell systems that supply this pathway, which is called the when pathway, and this is the where pathway, which end up in those areas that I was talking about, the supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus. You don't have to worry about all this detail, but the important thing is magnocells supply these dorsal roots, whereas parvo cells supply the ventral roots. But don't think that they're entirely separate. This system here is for focusing your attention, for moving your attention around. And so when you want this visual word form area to attend to a particular word, it projects straight down there and facilitates the visual word form area. So the attentional system, as this is sometimes called, 
um, activates the visual word form area or facilitates it to attend to a particular word. And you will see that's uh, relevant in a moment. This shows you the whole system in diagrammatic form. These magna cells project via a private, um, private laminae in a, a structure called the LGN that goes to the visual cortex at the back of the head and then dominates the areas that control your eye movements, the posterior parietal cortex, which is the supramarginal and angular gyrus that I was talking about, the frontal eye fields here, the superior collectus here, and the cerebellum here. They all control your eye movements and actually your visual attention as well. It's now known. And what I'm going to show you is the visual magnocellular system is impaired in poor readers. First of all, uh, you've, or you haven't seen this yet, but this is the same uh, work by Galaberda showing that the magna cells in that relay nucleus called the LGN are smaller in uh, uh, dyslexics who come to post-mortem. I'm going to show you some of our own work that shows that the uh, evoked brain potentials uh, in response to a moving target are reduced in dyslexics compared with good readers. I'm going to show you that they have reduced visual motion sensitivity. That is, mo visual motion sensitivity is a sign of visual magnocellular function, and dyslexics have reduced sensitivity. There's a lot of other things that I'm going to show you about poor eye control as well, but the rest I certainly won't have time to tell you about. There are the, there's a whole, whole gamut of things that suggest that the visual magnocellular system is impaired in poor readers. But I have to give you a, what you might call a health warning, and that is that these claims have all been vigorously opposed, opposed. And there are three reasons for this. First of all, the definition of this magna system strictly, anatomically, is only separate in the periphery, that is in the eye, uh, or just leading from the eye, and the, in the LGN, and actually uh, the first uh, relay in the visual cortex. That's the only place where they're anatomically separate. After that, they, inter they interconnect a lot. That means that to choose absolutely selective stimuli for the magnocellular system is impossible. Nevertheless, we can get some way towards it. The third thing is that we're only claiming that these dyslexics have mild deficits in the magnocellular system, and therefore that requires highly sensitive tests to reveal them. And dare I say it, many of the people who oppose our view simply don't use sensitive enough tests. Um, Heinz Wimmer will say use one of our tests, but we'll come to that later. Uh, nevertheless, in the last 10 years, 90% of new research has found evidence of a magnocellular deficit in dyslexics. So there is one author who shall remain nameless who's written 20 papers criticizing mainly other people's work about the magnocellular hypothesis. Needless to say, I disagree with him. Now, this is the evidence I mentioned earlier. These are the, uh, these are the magnocellular layers of the LGN. And you'll see in a, in a controlled good reader brain come uh, uh, post-mortem that there's a clear separation of the magnocellular layers from the parvocellular layers of this relay nucleus. But in dyslexics, they're not separate. And indeed, the, parv the magnocells are not only smaller, they're 30% smaller, but they also mismigrate into the parvocellular layers. And this theme of mismigration you should be aware of because, of course, those ectopias that I talked about earlier are also an example of mismigration of certain cells. And I'll come back to that when I deal with some genetics. Here's another piece of evidence which I think is very interesting. This is called diffusion tensor imaging. What you can do is you can now, in vivo, in an intact human being, you can get an idea of how large the axons, the neuronal processes leaving from one place to another are using this technique called diffusion tensor imaging. And what this shows here, just here, the yellow and blue parts here, are that in dyslexics, these axons leaving the, the um, supramarginal gyrus and going towards the frontal lobe are smaller in dyslexics than controls. And picking up on the question we had this morning, Actually, if you train a dyslexic successfully to read using phonological techniques, it turns out that these axons grow in size. It's very exciting. So you can, you can to some extent, 
um, compensate for this smaller size of axon in dyslexics by successful training. And we may come back to that. We've done some work um, with what are called visual evoked potentials, where we move a target in front of the subject and we pick up the arrival of the message in the visual cortex. I won't go into the details, but what you can see here is that in good readers, they are, the message arrives some 20, 10 to 20 milliseconds earlier than in poor readers. And that 20 milliseconds adds up to a much bigger difference when you get to here, something like 200 milliseconds different. That's a fifth of a second difference if you have impaired development of your magnocellular system. And finally, we can measure the motion sensitivity of uh, children, um, which is a proxy for magnocellular sensitivity. And you can see that there's a broad relationship over both good and bad readers. These are good readers, these are bad readers. Um, that the, the worse your sensitivity, i.e. the more of a, se a set of dots that have to move together for you to see them, the worse your magnocellular sensitivity, the worse your reading. And what we're saying is that there is a, a relationship between magnocellular function and your ability to stabilize the eyes. So if you have unwanted image motion, which is called retinal slip, that is normally detected by the magnocellular system, and that in turn feeds back to the eye muscle control system, which in turn locks the eyes on target. This is a negative feedback control system that a lot of people have studied, and so take it from me, it's true. Um, that in turn gives you visual perceptual stability. That in turn enables you to identify a letter order. Now notice this is all a magnocellular function. The magnocellular system doesn't actually identify the letters, but what it does is it identifies the order of the letters. And that, in turn, allows you to achieve what's called orthographic skill, that is, the visual skills of reading. But what is more controversial, but Moray, for instance, would agree with me, is once you have learnt orthographic skill, once you've learnt that a word can be expressed or represented as a series of letters, then you can go back and see that also it can be represented or split down into a set of sounds. So you can match the letters with their sounds, but you can only do it once you've understood the letters and their order, a visual phenomenon. And so what we're saying is that there is a problem in many dyslexics whereby their eyes wobble. You'll see here, I hope, that this, this is a normal child. You can see the eyes have to move a bit, where reasons I won't bother you with, but they're not, there's not very great movement of the eyes. This is a child just looking at a simple X, trying to keep his eyes as still as possible. This is a dyslexic trying to do the same thing, and you can see the eyes are moving much more, uh, and they are moving uh, sometimes several degrees, which they shouldn't be. This is a child trying to keep his eyes steady. And what we found is that that child had reduced magnocellular function. And so what we're saying is that when a child has this problem, instead of seeing this wonderful tower, which is the tower of my college in Oxford, of course, Magdalen College, Oxford, go there, look at it, it's most beautiful, the most beautiful tower in England, in my opinion. Um, instead of seeing it in all its majesty, they see this sort of smear. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's as bad as that in dyslexics, but I hope this gives you the idea of how if you don't have visual stability, you can't see things properly. And even if your, uh, your parvo system is okay, you still will not be able to see the letters because your eyes aren't steady enough for the parvo system to work properly. It's even worse in what's called virgins. When your eyes are reading, when you're reading, your eyes have to be pointing in an arrowhead like this. And that means that there's an additional complication to keeping them stable. Suppose for a moment your left eye is looking at the D of dog, and then a moment later it's looking at the G of dog, but you don't know that's happened, likewise with the right eye. Then what will happen is that you'll see something more like this. Let's, let's hope it works this time. So you see that that will definitely cause you problems. You won't be able to say which is dog and which is bog, and so you will get it wrong, as I just did. 
Um, and this is exactly what many of the children I first saw complained of. They said, the letters go all blurry. The letters move over each other. The letters seem to float all over the page. That certainly doesn't occur with all children, because many children don't know that this shouldn't happen. So they never comment on it. But a lot of children, if you actually close question them, you find that this is the sort of problem they're suffering from. And this is a lovely picture that was drawn to me by a dyslexic girl of the sort of distortions that she saw when she tried to read. Admittedly, these are a bit exaggerated, but I think you think that's a pretty impressive picture. Now, this um, theory, this series of observations, suggests that the magnocellular system is impaired in dyslexics. And I'm now going to show you some ways in which we can actually improve it, which is so simple, people won't believe it's true. Um, one of the features of the, of the magnocellular system is that although it doesn't support color, nevertheless, it responds best to what are called the red and green cones. Most of the input to the um, magnocellular system is from red and green uh, cones. And that means that it's best activated by a sort of uh, yellow color. Um, and therefore, if we use yellow, and actually it's on the orange side of yeah, yellow because most of us have more red than green cones. So if we use that color, we can actually improve children's reading. And this is an example. This is a child who, uh, before, uh, you could not re uh, uh, read their writing at all. Afterwards, it had improved enormously. And in fact, we can, when we did a randomized controlled trial, so I, neither we nor they knew which color glasses were meant to help, we found that those in whom, for other reasons, we thought yellow should help, their reading improved in th three months by six and a half months, whereas children who had a, a, a placebo pair of uh, spectacles didn't um, uh, only improved by about one month in a month, so in, in three months. So in fact, they fell behind. However, another set of children are helped by blue spectacles, and we find these even more interesting. Because the blue that we happen to choose purely uh, uh, by uh, pragmatic techniques, finding out which one works, happens to be the blue that is best absorbed by a new kind of retinal ganglion cell that was only discovered about five years ago, which actually contains a blue pigment called melanopsin. Um, and these ganglion cells don't go to the uh, conscious visual system, they go to what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is, contains the body's clock. It has two genes, basically, clock and purr, that go tick and tock. And the tick and the tock take 24 hours. So that's a diurnal rhythm generator. It's a clock, but of course it has to be synchronized to ongoing day length. And so we need a, 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 um, a, a light input that will synchronize it to the day length. This happen, blue light happens to be the best kind of light for this, as I can explain later. And so this system is for synchronizing the clock to uh, seasonal day length changes. And what's interesting from our point of view is this route here, because the suprachiasmatic nucleus wakes you up during the day, mainly by activating an area called the locus ceruleus, which then activates the magnocellular system particularly. So your magnocellular system up here, the dorsal route out of your visual system, is particularly activated during daylight by this system. So we hypothesize that our blue spectacles, our blue light, were working by this route. And we know that these can work. This is an example of a child's mother wrote to us, said the blue eyes stopped his eyes moving. He could see the words much more clearly. Um, and this is the same kind of study, randomized controlled trial, in which we gave the child blue spectacles or spectacles that uh, were just gray lenses. And you can see that their reading, actually, in this route, in this group, increased by 12 months in the three months. That is incredible. I, we, we've never seen quite that, I must admit, since then. But it's pretty good. And obviously, that's very, very significantly better than uh, re receiving the placebo. And spelling also, which always comes later, improved more significantly in those who received the blue spectacles. And 
we've discovered that actually the uh, various simple measures of improvement in eye control were also improved. So with, with both the yellow and the blue, uh, in the yellow chooses uh, convergence improved uh, from a distance of about here. So if you can, if this is 25 centimeters. Uh, before they wore the yellow spectacles, on average, they couldn't converge closer than about 25, well, maybe here, 25 cent centimeters, whereas after, they could come back out to about 10 centimeters. So it improved their binocular control with both the yellow in yellow choosers and the blue in blue choosers. Now, here's something that was totally serendipitous. This is the migraine fairy. And I'm sure some of you suffer from the migraine fairy. What we discovered was that in the children who um, benefited from the blue, their headaches went. What, not only that, but their sleep patterns improved. Whereas if we gave, by mistake, uh, uh, people with headaches yellow, it actually made them worse. That's this red. So we could actually prove headaches. And that actually fits with a lot that's known about migraine. Because the, another aspect of the diurnal rhythms is that they control the vascular system. You need more blood during the day, basically, uh, and less blood at night. If you have too much blood, then you get headaches. That's really oversimplifying. But there is a connection between the diurnal rhythms and migraine. Many migraineurs have a, a poor sleep rhythms as well. And we, it can improve the sleep rhythms in those children who benefit from blue glasses. And in fact, and this is totally speculative at the moment, we think, we haven't proven it yet, that we can help adults with migraine by giving them the same blue spectacles. But don't go away and say, tell everybody that. Try them, because there's no harm in it, but I, uh, we haven't proven this at all. But this, this shows you some of the evidence that we're beginning to get that shows that our blue spectacles are working in the way we think. This is... Uh, recording the amount of melatonin, which is the night hormone that, that is uh, secreted during the night. This is in control undergraduates, and these are in uh, the same undergraduates agreeing to be subjected to just 15 minutes of um, the blue light at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and you, uh, during winter. So they were, the, the, that was true night for them. And what you can see is the melatonin, that small amount of, uh, of blue light reduce their secretion of melatonin by a significant amount. And that suggests that the blue light is working through this system of suprachiasmatic nucleus that also controls the secretion of melatonin because it controls diurnal rhythms. So to cut a long story short, we find that about a quarter of the children we see can benefit from yellow, a quarter from blue, uh, and about half, I'm afraid, do not benefit from color. Yeah? Sorry. <laughs> well, that's probably better. Um, so this is just to show a, a summary of the kinds of effects we can get with very simple things such as yellow spectacles or blue spectacles. I haven't told you about time to tell you about occlusion and search. And I'm shortly going to tell you about omega-3s, which is, to me, even more interesting. Because it's, the magnocellular system, in my view, is not confined to the visual system. There are magnocells throughout the brain. 10% of your cells secrete or express on their surface a particular surface antigen called CAT301, which define them as being part of a separate group of neurons, a separate network. And they all have this, this um, feature of responding to change, rapid response to change. And so there are auditory magnocells as well. And that's why this guy, guy can't pronounce onion or union. Um, the starting point of this is that if I say the word bar, the b in that is separated from the da, the d in that, by a two simple differences and nothing else. Everything else is the same, but if you look at the frequencies generated by my, my throat, in the second formant, as it's called, which is um, developed by the la larynx, and the third, which is developed by the pharynx, you see the frequency goes up in b, but down in d. Everything else is identical. 
We pick up that difference between b and d by the fact that our ears are tuned to those frequency changes. And we can test people's sensitivity to frequency change, um, and we find that they are not so sensitive to uh, frequency change. And there's a lot of evidence now that there is underlying the phonological problems that dyslexics suffer from is the fact not only that they have this visual problem I've been talking about, but also they often have auditory magnocells that are impaired in their development. And therefore, they do not pick up these frequency changes. So there are these large neurons staining for CAT301 in the auditory brain stem that signal changes in sound, frequency, and amplitude. So they are very similar, analogous to the um, visual ones that we see in the visual system. Um, Galabert and his colleagues have shown that the dyslexics have smaller magnocellular neurons in the medial geniculate nucleus. That's the auditory relay nucleus. So just as they have smaller magnocells in the lateral geniculate nucleus, so they do in the medial geniculate nucleus. Actually, only on the left side, but uh, nevertheless, they're smaller. Uh, that means that they have lower uh, what's called amplitude and frequency modulation sensitivity, sensitivity to changes in frequency that are needed to pick up these differences in, uh, in uh, letter sounds. And these differences correlate with children's phonological deficits, such as um, uh, Frank was talking about this morning. We, we and others have shown that they have reduced our auditory evoked potentials that also correlate with the reading deficit. And though, therefore, I'm suggesting that dyslexics' poor phonology may in part result from impaired development of their auditory magnocells. And in fact, if you put all this together, you find that there's something like two thirds, if you throw in nonverbal IQ as well, you can explain about two thirds of children's reading dif differences. That's not just dyslexics, but also good readers. You can explain about two thirds of children's reading differences simply by knowing these things, their visual motion sensitivity and their auditory sensitivity and their nonverbal IQ. Now I'm going to briefly talk about the cerebellum, mainly for um, Angela's benefit. Cerebellum sits here, and if you unravel it, uh, it has about the same surface area as the whole of the cerebral cortex, although it's thinner. And it's our autopilot. It's responsible for, among other things, helping us to keep balance. So here's a, a, a normal child, and here's a dyslexic child, and all they're doing is standing on one leg with their eyes open. And what you see is the amount of wobble. There's a, uh, there's a sensor mounted on this child's head, and this is the amount of wobble that a child has trying to keep on, stand on one leg for, I think it's five seconds. And this is a dyslexic, and you can see there's a big difference. And if you do this in a number of dyslexics, you find that they have a big difference in their uh, uh, postural stability. That isn't a pure cerebellar um, test, but it uh, certainly is an indication of something wrong in the cerebellum. And in fact, there's quite a lot of evidence that the cerebellum is concerned with um, a reading. But my view is it's concerned with reading because the magnocellular system all projects to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a, your, your autopilot, and therefore it receives information about every sense that could relate to skilled movements. Obviously, one of the skilled or automatic movements is your ability to maintain your balance. And so it receives a very, very dense projection from these magnocellular systems. And that's, in fact, what I showed first with Mitch in the visual system. Now, these cerebellar neurons, many of them stain for this CAT301, i.e., they're part of the mag magnocellular system. And it's been shown by um, Angela and uh, Rod Nicholson uh, among others, that the cerebellum is underactive in many dyslexics. Explains their coordination problems, but not all of their reading difficulties, in my opinion. Um, and that's why balance exercises are unlikely to help many dyslexics to learn to read, as was claimed in the past. So this is just a summary of what I've just said about the sensory motor basis of dyslexia. Since I feel I'm running out of time, I'll move on quickly. And I'll move on from this, except to remind you that the magnocellular neurons are a whole system of neurons in the brain which are specialized for temporal processing. And I'll, I'll um, leave all the detail here, which you can read, I'm sure, in the 
summary, but um, I want to emphasize that they're very vulnerable to omega-3 fish oil deficiency, and I'll explain why. So what causes this general magnocellular impairment? I'm just going to talk about two aspects. There are many others, but these are the two that interest me. I'm afraid I haven't got time to talk about the immune system. So first of all, um, genetics. As a consequence of the fact that we've running, been running clinics for the last 20 years to help dyslexic or children with reading difficulties, we've amassed huge numbers of children, of families with dyslexia. And we were able to set up a genetic study. And we found, I'm going to talk about two genes that we've found ourselves, but there are other genes that other people have found. Uh, so the total number of genes that are in the frame, as it were, for the moment are about 10. I'm just going to about talk about two of them. One of them is this one called KIO319, which I'll talk about. But I will, uh, um, and this is the, uh, another one called the melanocortin receptor gene. Um, what happens is you look for association with particular um, what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are markers on chromosomes that we can now measure easily. And you see these arrows here are for the chromosome 6 one, and I'm just briefly going to talk about that, KIA0319. It's strongly expressed in the magnocellular systems. This is yellow for the dorsal route out of the visual system, and this is where this particular gene is strongly expressed in the brain. And what's fascinating about it is it controls migration. Early in your development in your mother's womb, um, your cortical cells start off around the ventricles, that's the hollows in the middle of the brain, um, as stem cells. They split into two. One is a what's called a radial glial cell, and the other is a nerve cell that moves up the radial glial cell until it comes to the right place where it's going to stop. So this is um, layer one, this is layer three, this is layer six. Uh, they stop in the right place. If you knock out the KIO319 gene that we found on chromosome 6, that doesn't happen at all. Instead of migrating up there, these cells just hang around here. They can't move. And in particular, the ones that can't move are the large ones, i.e. the magnet cells. Now, I'm not saying we've proven that bit yet, but watch this space. The next gene I want to talk about, which is another one we've discovered, is this one here, the melanocortin gene. And what's important from my point of view is that this is concerned. Melanocortin is a, um, a hormone or set of hormones that control things like your pigmentation, also controls your appetite, also controls um, your diurnal rhythms. Um, what I particularly want you to concentrate on, the fact is that omega-3s, that is fish oils, interact with these melanocortin, uh, melanocortin in the receptor to control your food intake, in particular to decrease it, um, and also to increase energy expenditure. So this will reduce your weight. This set up here will increase your weight. Now, one of the reasons that my brother and I are very fond of each other, again, we weren't too fond of each other when we were young, of course, um, is that he concentrates on cooking fish. I'm interested in the way fish oils, in particular these omega-3s, DHA and EPA, the way those cells, uh, the way those fish oils contribute to the, com uh, of the function of these magno cells. Because they are kinky, um, the omega-3s, and that means they can't pack tightly. And that means when the channels in this uh, neuron have to open, they can do so quickly because the, the membrane is semi-fluid. It's not stiff. It's like the difference between, uh, let's say, margarine and olive oil. Uh, the, the, this is much more fluid, and therefore the, the, um, uh, the channels can open rapidly and therefore react quickly. Uh, so these magno cells are very vulnerable to fish oil deficiency. And our Western diet is a disaster. It has too much of all these things, and has too little of all these, but in particular, these omega-3s from fish. Do you know that 75% of 18-year-olds eat no fish at all nowadays in the UK? 
Um, and then there's a problem, a subsidiary problem. There's far too much omega-6 compared with omega-3. And I can go into that if anybody's interested. And this is the consequence. Not very romantic. <laughs> so what we've been doing is we've been looking to see whether omega-3 fatty acid deficiency is a problem in children who can't read. Um, it's not just children we can't read, it's all kinds of neurodevelopmental problems that uh, Frank was going through. It's not just dyslexia, but dyspraxia, ADHD, um, and even uh, developmental uh, uh, dysphasia. Um, and also we found that a lot of young offenders have all these conditions, ADHD, dyslexia, et cetera, et cetera. And they all have omega-3 deficiency. There are certain signs of it. Um, uh, we've also found, at least in dyslexics and in ADHD, that you can, you can measure their blood and brain omega-3 fatty acids and find they're deficient. I won't go into the technology now, but uh, take it from me, you can. Um, but more importantly, we found in randomized controlled trials that omega-3 fish oil supplements can very significantly improve not only magnocellular function, but also attention, also reading, and violent offenses. I'm just going to give you two examples. I'm sure I'm running out of time. First is what we call the Durham randomized controlled trial, where we gave omega-3 Echosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, DHA. Those are both fish oils. Don't worry about the names. Just remember EPA and DHA. We found that they help poor readers to improve their concentration and their reading. This is the group that randomized controlled trials, so neither side knew which was receiving the active and which was receiving the placebo. So you can see there's a huge difference in reading outcome of these children who received the omega-3s compared with placebo. And even more exciting from my point of view is we went into a prison in Aylesbury and we did the same sort of thing, only now we added vitamins and minerals to the omega-3s. Uh, here are these young offenders' rate of offending. That's about one a month in these kids. They're, very, they're, they're prone to thump each other, I'm afraid. We gave half of them the active omega-3 vitamins and minerals and the other half placebo, which looked and tasted exactly the same. You can see we reduced their rate of offending by uh, up more than a third in the case of violent offenses. So there is something in the omega-3 story, in my opinion, and you'll read a lot more about it elsewhere. But now I haven't got time to tell you anything more. But to conclude, uh, to tell you dyslexics have different brains. I'm not saying they're raw, bad brains. They're just different due to mildly impaired development of these magnocells. This may result from genetic vulnerability, nutritional deficiency. There are other things that I haven't had time to talk about. This knowledge is very exciting because of the things we can do about it I've talked about. But I want to emphasize, I always want to emphasize at the end of this, that magnocellular weakness is often associated with parvocellular strength, in particular in holistic perception. So we wouldn't want to get rid of dyslexia. Otherwise, we'd never have had these fantastic people like Rodin, Winston Churchill, um, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, we now think was dyslexic, et cetera, et cetera. So don't get rid of dyslexia, learn to understand it. Thank you very much.